and it's just basketball. At the end of the day, it's just basketball. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe on the way in the door, my people. I hope you all are having a truly, truly fantastic day today. So, no doubt that all of you have heard that uh, the Lakers were trying to get Coach uh, Dan Hurley to come and coach the Lakers and the Deer <laughs> and Anthony Davis. And uh, I think he was offered $70 million. To which he turned down. And before we get into this article, I just want to say this to uh, LeBron James fans, especially the LeBron James fanboys, is um, it's not just basketball. It is not just basketball. And, and a lot of what we're talking about here on life, uh, a lot of what people cannot stand about LeBron James is more life related. I mean, it's sports, it's, it's basketball, but it's related to life. And the things that LeBron James does in basketball, uh, the things that we despise about him in basketball is things you would despise about any person in life. It's the never accountability. It's the constantly looking for shortcuts and, uh, you know, shortcuts may even be a, a too light of a word. It's, it's the cheating. It's the cheating of the game. Uh, and it's the unwillingness to compete. You know, the thinking that you are entitled to the best of the best. And if things aren't going your way, uh, it is somebody else's fault. You know, LeBron James has uh, gotten rid of coaches even after winning a championship uh, 2020. <laughs> the Disney ring. You know, LeBron James has left coaches after winning back-to-back -back championships. Miami. You know, LeBron James has left coaches that supposedly coached him to the greatest comeback in his career 2016. And then he has come back to say that he wished he had coaches like Eric Spostra and Tyron Lue. I mean, the, 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 the things this guy does is just despicable. And so it's going to be very interesting to see who ends up coaching the Lakers. Uh, reports are also said that the players don't particularly care for J.J. Reddick. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, I've said this from the beginning. If J.J. Reddick becomes the coach of the Lakers, it is essentially LeBron James becoming the coach of the Lakers. This, this is what I think. I, I think J.J. Reddick would just be a puppet for LeBron, uh, and <laughs> they will probably be drawing up plays on their podcast uh, for all to see and dissect. <laughs> but anyway, let's check out this article. It says, in a decision that reverberated throughout the basketball community, Dan Hurley has chosen to remain at UConn, turning down a reported lucrative offer from the Laker, Los Angeles Lakers to become their next head coach. ESPN's Adrian Wagonowski uh, first reported the news on Monday, and the university confirmed to NBC Connecticut. Hurley later released a statement about his decision to stay. I am, I am humbled by this entire experience, Hurley said. At the end of the day, I am extremely proud of the championship culture we have built at Connecticut. We met as a team before today's workout, and our focus right now is getting better this summer and connecting as a team as we continue to pursue championships. The offer reportedly worth $70 million over six years was apparently not enough to entice Hurley away from UConn, where he now seeks a three-peat, hoping to become the first head coach to do so since UCLA's John Wooden, who won an unprecedented seven straight titles between 1967 and 1973. This pivotal moment not only reinforces Hurley's commitment to the program he has built into a national powerhouse, 
but also leaves the Lakers continuing their search for a new head coach. Round of applause uh, for Dan Hurley. Round of applause for Dan Hurley. I have no problem with this. I've been seeing people on first take and whatnot talking about what an offer he's turned down. What an opportunity he's turned down to coach uh, two of the greatest players in LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Can't believe he turned this down. Blah, 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 blah. I know. Round of applause because, first of all, uh, money isn't everything. Money isn't everything. It, th this is what you fanboys don't get. Because when someone is uh, criticizing your king, one of the first things out your mouth bef besides a uh, hater is saying, oh, well, he's a billionaire. Well, he's rich. And what are you? Money isn't everything. Money does not make you a good human being. Uh, money does not make you a great basketball player. And money certainly doesn't make you the GOAT. <laughs> Money can't make you play defense. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, money and everything. And I, I think it's respectable and commendable that he is looking to keep building on something that he has started building. Again, this is what we talk about so much on this channel that you fanboys just do not get is the building. Legacies are built. They're not bought. <laughs> you can't buy your legacy. You can't shortcut your way to a legacy. You can't team hop to legacies. Uh, <laughs> you can't pay people in the media to, to uh, add to your legacy, to say what you would like your legacy to be. And I guess even more importantly than that, you know what's so bothersome about LeBron James. And, and the whole, I, you know, I don't know what's going on with the Lakers. Again, the Lakers are a clown show right now. Uh, next year is going to be... Yeah, okay. But anyway, you know, the, the thing about LeBron James that I really don't understand because, you know, so much has been coming out lately with people, uh, particularly Kendrick Perkins. So, you know, I was watching the other day that I guess he got a call from Rich Paul or something on LeBron James' behalf. I guess this was before LeBron James unfollowed him on Twitter or, or maybe it was right after. But, you know, except... Uh, upset with some of the things Kendrick Perkins has been saying, but my thing is this, like, how fulfilled could you really be if the only way to convince people of your greatness is to drop, is to try to brainwash them into thinking you're great? You know, is to try to put out these narratives through mainstream media. It's like, for instance, if you were actually successful in getting people to call you the GOAT, besides your brainwashed fanboy CFL members, <clears throat> if you were actually successful at that, how could you even feel good about it? You know, that that's like, let's say you're running a race and you come in fifth place in the race, but you pay the announcer or, or, in, in, or whatever, whoever's in charge of, uh, you know, judging the race uh, and you pay them to say that you won even though the world could clearly see that you didn't win but they just announced hey LeBron James run the, won the race yeah I know everybody watched him come in fifth but you know he paid us a million dollars so we're gonna say he won how good could you actually feel about that knowing you didn't win the race LeBron James if you were actually able to convince everybody that you were the GOAT, how could you feel good about that knowing that you had to convince people of this? Again, this is the thing that people, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, but this is the thing that people don't get. Again, I was just watching a video talking about how people were saying Michael Jordan was the greatest player before he ever won a championship. You know, I think it was pretty consensus by his second championship, but before he ever won, People were already saying this, and this is my thing. This is why I say the eye test is really unfailed. Like, if someone is that much of a cut above, you can see it. The person doesn't have to win a championship. The person doesn't have to uh, accumulate a bunch of stats. It's like, you can just see it right there. 
that, hey, this guy is a cut above everyone else. But anyway, back to what I was saying. It's like, you fanboys do not get the uh, importance of building, and apparently Dan Hurley does get that importance. You know, he's uh, potentially, you know, he's trying to prepare to go for a three-peat, uh, something your king doesn't know about. <laughs> You know, to go for a three-peat at UConn. And I think that's very commendable that he is committed to continuing to try to build that legacy uh, that he started. Again, when, when you actually put in work to build something, you don't want to easily let that go. Like, all these media people trying to criticize him for not taking that ridiculous Lakers job, you know, not taking that unstable Lakers job. You know, I don't care if he... Uh, you know, was going to get $70 million over six years. Uh, if LeBron James is on your team, then everything is unstable. If LeBron James is on your team, everything is, is going to be unstable because LeBron James is the most unstable, most inconsistent superstar that we've ever had. Um, but yeah, so to... To choose to stay there and continue to build that legacy is just like I, just like we talked about, you know, in 1998 when Michael Jordan said, "Hey, if if Phil is gone, I'm gone," you know. And again, you fanboys want to attribute that to, uh, oh, of course. Well, Phil was such a great coach. No, it wasn't about that. It was about the fact that Michael Jordan understood that we have built this thing together. I'm not gonna start over because building something takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Again, going back to the last dance, MJ said this himself. During the second three-peat when he had all the new guys in, like Tony Kukoc and Kerr and some of these players, he was like, look, I'm hard on them because you are not going to come in here and play with something that I've put in so much work to build. Like, we started from nothing. Chicago was a losing franchise. Again, the traveling cocaine circus. Chicago was a losing franchise, and Jordan went through the heartache and pain of going through the Pistons, you know, and, and uh, really building that team from scratch. So by the second three-peat, when you have a new cast of people except the, the nucleus of, you know, Jordan, Pippen, and Phil, and um, when they are coming in, it's like it is important, especially as a leader, to let let them know that, hey, this is not a joke and I'm not playing. Like when you come into practice, it is serious. We are practicing like it's the finals. Again, you stay ready. You don't have to get ready. There is no such thing as activate playoff mode. You stay in playoff mode. At least that's what Michael Jordan did. It was always playoffs off mode. It was always putting your very best out there. So, again, Jordan held his, those teammates accountable because of what he had built. Again, Jordan didn't want to start over without Phil Jackson because of what they had built, because Jordan understood the importance of building something. And again, round of applause for Dan Hurley for understanding that, hey, I've put this time into building, uh, into building this organization, and I want to continue with that. I want to see if we can go for a three-peat. I want to see if I can keep developing this winning culture that I have developed here. And why would I want to go? <laughs> why would I want to go coach an inconsistent, unaccountable superstar like LeBron James? Why would I want to go do that? Matter of fact, who wants to do that? Who would want to do that? What coach worth anything would want to even put themselves in that position? Again, because LeBron James is not a good leader, because LeBron James is not a good follower. It's been documented. It's been said. Like, people know this about LeBron James. Again, overriding play calls and this kind of thing. Who wants to go try to coach somebody like that? And all the great coaches throughout the history of basketball, the thing that they have in common is they have normally, especially coaches with multiple championships, they have coached great players. 
The players are the most important component in the equation. Are the players, are the transcendent players. LeBron James has not proved himself to actually be that. LeBron James has only proved that, hey, I am willing to, uh, I'm willing to leave teams. I'm willing to have teammates traded. I am willing to uh, try to get coaches fired. I'm willing to do all these things because I'm a spoiled brat. And if I'm not winning, it has to be something else besides me. And I'm not a truly hard worker, so I don't know what it's like to actually build something from scratch and keep building up on that thing. It's like you, if I was a Cleveland fan, I still wouldn't give LeBron James credit for that one championship. Cause it's like, okay, you come back and you get us one championship. It's like LeBron James did not build anything in Cleveland. He didn't build anything. And again, that uh, championship is questionable. And I guess you could say uh, with a lot of championships, there are questionable circumstances. But again, because of the patterns of LeBron James, we do not give LeBron James the benefit of the doubt because you started off taking shortcuts to win your championship. So you don't get the benefit of the doubt. You don't get the benefit of 2020 because your first three championships are super teams. Two in Miami, and then in 2016, you had Kyrie and Kevin Love. With Draymond getting kicked out, Andrew Bogut injured, and I feel like it was another injury on the Suns. Uh, somebody dropped that in the comments if you remember. I feel like the Sun, Suns, uh, the Warriors. I feel like the Warriors, besides Bogut, was somebody else. Um, I don't know, but anyway. Yeah, you, you don't get the benefit of the doubt when you've established a terrible track record for yourself. Like, again, if LeBron James had won those three championships in a respectable way, if he had won three championships without joining super teams, without taking shortcuts, and what then when it gets to 2020, then I think more people will give him the benefit of the doubt, even though it was weird uh, circumstances, unique circumstances around that championship. More people will give him the benefit of the doubt because he's proved himself a, a legitimate winner in the past. But when you have that track record of super teams and shortcuts, then you're not going to get the benefit of the doubt for that. Again, that championship is worthless. But anyway, <laughs> we are going to hold up here. It is going to be interesting. It's like, uh, so now is, are they going to be back on JJ Reddick? Is is this, is he the main? Or was this all the smoke screen to begin with <laughs> uh, in one way or another? And JJ Reddick has always been the uh, main candidate. But it's going to be curious to see who winds up with this coaching job. It's going to be very uh, interesting to see what is going on with the Lakers by next year. You know, are, are, who's going to be the coach and is Bronny James going to be on this team? You know. Uh, but anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments. What do you guys think about Dan Hurley turning down the $70 million over six years to coach the Deer? Did he miss out on an opportunity to p potentially uh, <laughs> take all the blame for losing. You know, who, who wouldn't want that? Uh, <laughs> what do you think is going to be the state of the Lakers next year? Is it going to officially be a clown show by next year? But anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments. You all have a truly fantastic day, and I'll see you next time. All right.